So uh, my name is Dave Grantham. Um, I have been the community architect for Live P2P this year and worked with several other teams in this space. And most of you know me from that um, part of my life and my career. But uh, I have done multiple tours of duty in the crypto wars, one and two, the surveillance wars against corporations and well-funded military governments, military units and stuff like that. So I, I've been involved with a lot of somewhat edgy software projects over the years, um, cryptography and things like that. And so um, what I'm going to try to do, this is probably going to be the most difficult talk I've ever done, simply because... I'm going to cover 20 years of decentralization research in 20 minutes. I'm going to try to catch you all up so that you can kind of at least grasp where we're going with the rest of this, okay? So uh, hold on to your butts. All right. Are you ready? I have 42 slides. Decentralization is the direction in which user sovereignty increases. It's about power. It's not about computers. Facebook is distributed. It is not decentralized. This is the traditional definition. We've somehow inverted this recently, but like in terms of uh, you know developing Western democracies, all the politicians that did that talked about decentralization in terms of power. I agree with them. Um, a few years ago, I think four or five years ago, I wrote these down. Um, how do you define user sovereignty? These are the six principles in which I follow whenever I build a distributed system. Okay, I'm not going to explain them. I have a whole blog post about this. Um, given those principles, you can rank distributed systems on a spectrum from user subjugation to user sovereignty. And it turns out that email is still the most decentralized system we have on the, on the internet, simply because I can use open tools, open protocols, open formats, and even the, the sheer might of Google cannot keep me from taking all of my email off of their system, putting it on my own system, or another, another email provider without a loss of service and almost instantaneously, depending on how many emails you have. Um, also, in terms of decentralization, a couple of years ago, I also wrote this. I, I sat down to try to figure out what are the actual problems, the, 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 the problems that are orthogonal to each other, that do not overlap, that you have to have a solution for whenever you build a fully decentralized system. I came up with these nine. Again, I'm not going to explain them. I have another blog post on this. Um, this is an entire hour-long talk in and of itself, but it creates a really great model that you can use to judge and score ostensibly decentralized systems. So let's take Git, okay? Um, one of the, actually, let me go back to this. One of the ways you can use this model, there's two ways, actually. You can say, if I'm building a, defend, a distributed system that I want to defend against corporate centralization, government takeover, whatever, I have to provide a decentralized solution to each one of these problems decentralized one. The other way to look at it is if you look at an existing decentralized system that doesn't solve some of these, it's actually a huge economic opportunity for you and you and me to create a centralized corporate solution and literally make a billion dollars. I'll show you how. Um, with Git, they didn't solve these. That made GitHub inevitable because this is exactly what GitHub does. Whoops. It's exactly what GitHub does. And how much did GitHub sell to Microsoft for? How many billions of dollars? Billions. Yeah, OK. So here's the other one. I, I have an endless deck of these. I can do an entire hour of these analysis and go into in depth on all of these. Bitcoin, it doesn't solve any of these, which makes Coinbase inevitable. Because this is exactly what Coinbase does. And how much did Coinbase? How much is Coinbase worth now? Like billions of dollars. Yeah. So I gave a talk similar to this at one point, and I did this for um, Secure Scuttlebutt. And a week later, the super notes were created because I pointed out that they didn't do this, this, and I was like, literally, you can make a billion dollars, make Scuttlehub.com, and you know, do a corporate takeover of the Scuttlehub network, and they immediately changed it. Okay. So what's the goal? When you're building a distributed system, what's the actual goal? And I've started using this term, metastable, because decentralized systems have to exist without any central coordination. Um, the goal here, the ultimate goal, if you're like me, who have worked on software projects that were actively attacked by well-funded militaries, you want a system that is built entirely from mobile devices that join and leave the network randomly, change their IP addresses randomly, 
and yet it still persists over a long period of time without any fixed infrastructure. So if you have no fixed infrastructure, there's no point of leverage. There's no way they can take over your domain name. There's no way they can attack your server. There's nothing. It literally becomes a system that is ephemeral in its nature, and yet it still exists. It's a ghost that can hurt you, but you can't hurt it. And this is, like, I'm sure scares the hell out of people who want to control the internet. So how do we do that? No, let's, let's analyze this. So um, decentralized systems are just peers and links. And for the longest time, I thought this was an exercise in peer behavior. How do you build a stable distributed system? Oh, we got to certainly build peers that can um, you know, somehow find each other. Let's do all these protocols to solve like discovery and all this other stuff. Well, this is actually the results of an empirical. That we first did, I first did the math, and then we did an empirical experiment that confirms this. These are probability curves. Um, these are the number of hours, average hours in a 24-hour period that a peer is online. This is the number of peers. I think maybe some of you have heard this before, but recently I've, I've heard people, they must have read my paper or something, because I heard someone stand up and say, when you have about 200 peers, that's all you need, right? So here's 200 peers. This is five nines probability that if um, the average time online is two hours a day for a peer, you get five nines probability that two peers will be online and be able to talk to each other. So if you, you and 199 of your friends exist, or are in a, in a distributed system, you, you can, you can always be online. And as long as there's two peers that can talk to each other at any point in time, they can do a sync, a state update, and the distributed system effectively exists, right? Turns out, though, peer behavior isn't the dominant thing that determines whether a distributed system constantly fights entropy or if it trends towards a stable state and um, preferential attachment, meaning it becomes the network, right? It's not peer behavior, it's actually linked behavior. And I'm gonna show you how. So how I discovered this was analyzing what are the different distributed systems out there, which ones are stable, um, and then what are their main characteristics? And it, and it turns out the only one that we really have is, is the web. Okay, and, and I, to prove that there is only one web, when your friend says, hey, I'm gonna set up a blog, you don't ask them which web the blog is gonna be on, because there's only one, right? There's effectively only one, and it's an ad hoc distributed system. Um, servers come and go all the time. Links change all the time. We all used to complain about this, but it didn't change the fact that the web trends towards stability, because it still exists. Right? It does have centralized pieces. I will argue that that's, that's a legitimate criticism of this analysis, but, but it really is a peer-to-peer system-ish, you know, if you look at web servers and squint and kind of turn your head sideways. Um, what's interesting, though, is that why is it the web and why don't we have other thes? Like, why don't we have the peer-to-peer -peer network? Right? It turns out the links in the systems are the actual reason. This is my thesis here. So, and I'm actually trying to turn this into a PhD thesis at the University of Utah. Hi, Professor Richie, talking to you. Looking for an advisor. Um, okay, uh, URLs can be valid, invalid, but more importantly, they're also partially valid. And this is the key. This is the key, okay? Um, I'm also a Husky, went to the University of Washington, go dogs. Um, you look at a URL, this is a link in the web, you have this piece here that's very stable. Okay, this piece can be, you know, high entropy, can change all the time, but this piece doesn't change. So if you have like a full URL, let's say this URL doesn't go to an actual page. This doesn't mean I can't talk to the servers at Washington, the University of Washington. I can because this is still valid. And, and what has happened on the web, what has evolved over time, is that you, whenever you have a URL like this, you don't get a 404, you get a page that's like, ah, we don't know what, you're looking for, but maybe you can search and find what you're looking for, or this suggests maybe you're looking for this, and it gives you alternatives, right? And so what this does is it allows for unilateral and secure, if it's over HTTPS, and you're using entity verified TLS, you know, X509 certificates, um, so you know who you're talking to, like I know I'm talking to the University of Washington or whatever. Um, it allows for a unilateral and secure restoration of partially invalid links. So this means that the network itself is self-healing. And it's this that gives you a distributed system that persists. 
even with the churn and the entropy that we all experience on the internet. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, that this is the biggest mistake we made. Um, I picked a, I had an AI generator retro sci-fi, you know, with Soviets on the moon, because like, think of the, the different future we could have had if we all chose not to use pub key identifiers. I, I asked it to say, uh, do not use pub key identifiers. Um, if we had chose not to use pub keys, we would be in an entirely different place because we could have self-healing links and distributed systems that persist. Um, but because we use pub keys, we don't actually. That is the primary reason we do not. That's my thesis. And the reason is, well, we're running ahead of myself. The reason is pub keys are only valid or invalid. And if you have the invalid one because the key's been rotated or it's been compromised or whatever, there's no way to unilaterally and securely restore your link, because what you have is an invalid public key. And when someone rotates their keys, you don't know that, right? But if a URL, a server on, on the web changes their URL pattern, you know, their router for, you know, whatever, move their pages, um, and you go to that URL, you're not, your link is not broken. You can actually fix it. And so really the solution here in all of our distributed systems, not just identity systems, but also in blockchains and all this stuff, is that you need the links to be this three-state self-healing kind of thing. So where am I going with this? And how do we do things like build the web of trust and do provable provenance off-chain and all that other stuff? We've invented, I and a couple of my friends, um, in fact, Mike Lauder um, is a fantastic cryptographer. Some of you probably know him. Uh, he and I first worked together on Hyperledger Ursa, the crypto library at the Hyperledger Project. And um, he's been heavily involved in SSI and in, in our community for a while. He, he's the author of the Shamir secret sharing library that I think everybody uses. <laughs> um, built this thing called a provenance log. It's an IPLD data structure. They have sequence numbers as a series of events, right? The IPLD, they have backlinks. Um, inside of them, they have uh, lock and unlock WebAssembly scripts that run in a VM that has a spec around what functions are exposed. And we call it the WAC VM because it's the WebAssembly cryptographic construct standard. So it has things like check signature. Works very much like Bitcoin in that sense. That, that like sequence number two, Run, we run the unlock script over here, and it takes the data from this event to prime a, a stack state, and then we run the lock scripts in this one to validate that. And if it validates, then that's the second one is valid. And this is not um, new. There have been other people who have proposed this, but they always run into a situation of like, what happens when someone steals your keys? What's new about these is that we built the WAC, the VM itself, um, yeah, so that it has a proof precedence mechanism. So the lock scripts themselves have a series of checks in them. And the first check uh, runs, and if it doesn't pass, like check signature, it runs the second one. But uh, for every one of the check functions that fail, it increments an internal counter. And then you just design it so that the protocol for these things, when they're validated, is that if you have two competing entries, meaning they have the same sequence number, that whichever one passes the lock script check with the lowest validation number, it takes precedence. So this is like the Bitcoin protocol where it's like all the miners just move to the longest chain. It's just a thing they all agree to do and that's how we resolve forking in, in the Bitcoin network or in, in other proof of work systems. In this case, if you have two competing entries, you always pick the one that checks with the lowest um, check count. So um, the trick here is that when you make your lock scripts, you make your highest priority a social, like a, a threshold signature. So you can do full IAM with social recovery. So like the first check is a check sig and it's, it's a threshold signature and the next one is a pub key and the next one like, I don't know, like a password check or whatever. So if someone steals my keys and they create the next event and I see that, I can go to my threshold cohort, my friends or whatever and say, hey, um, someone stole my keys. I need to ro force rotate back. Will you sign this for me? And then they create a threshold signature, and then when I publish it, my, my version has a lower precedent number, so it's like zero instead of one, and therefore all the validators that do check it pick mine over theirs, right? So this is how we resolve the, the race to the bottom on key compromise. Um, 
Let's see here. What can you do with these? Primary purpose is verifiable key history. Okay, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, risk my reputation, and I'm going to say that the, the minimum unit of identity in digital identity is not a public key pair. It's actually a cryptographically verifiable key history. If you don't have that, then you don't have any system that persists, right? And I'll show you why you want to do this. So this would be like my, you know, my public key. I publish one here. It's a multi-key, which we're proposing a new standard for multi-keys. It's a multi-formats thing. I know, boom, fudge over here is like, <laughs> please don't do that. It pisses everybody off. <laughs> but we needed it, so we, invent, we, we created one. And then if I wanted to rotate my keys, I just go and I create a new value for pub key, right? And then I rotate again, a new value for pub key. Um, one thing I didn't show here is that if I know a key has been compromised, what I'll do is I'll put a delete in here and then an update. So I'll say delete the previous value and then update it to the new value to signal, it's just colloquialism, to signal that I know that it was compromised. So anything that was signed by that key should be uh, mistrusted. Um, I, the other thing you can do is you can use these things as universal launch pads or coordinators. So you can put any kind of data in these things because they have a key value pair system. I should show you one thing I forgot to point out is that inside these, you have these key value pair operations. It consists of a no op, an update, or a delete. Um, so you can, each event has a set of operations that you apply to a virtual key value pair store. So it builds up a database over time. Um, and you can do full delegation on, on it's, it has a key path structure and you can do full delegation. So I can have a lock script on a subset. So, you know, Robin, I could delegate to Robin that he can update the values in my public, in my provenance log in a certain subsection, as long as he's just touching that part and then it, then it checks. Um, all right, where were we at here? So this one's cool because I can put any kind of information in this. It doesn't have to be personally identifiable. It could be uh, endpoints or things like this. This is going to allow us to shift our, our security models from pre-issued um, verifiable credentials to what I call late binding trust, where at the time of transaction, you hit the endpoint because the endpoint stuff is here. Um, and you verify that what's in here still matches with the endpoint. So I could put in like an endpoint to a KYC provider or, you know, any kind of Oracle or whatever saying like that, that's going to vouch for me. It, it's the third party nature of a lot of identity transactions. Um, I wanted to point out my, my legal name used to be Dave Hughesby. So last year I was Dave Hughesby, but in January I changed it to my real family name, which is Dave Grantham. And so in my provenance log, I would update my telegram handle, which I did to that. And I could advertise this. And so these are IPLD data structures. They're IPFS native. They're published on IPFS. So if you have the identifier for these, which I'm about to talk about, you can get my provenance log and you can always get whatever data I'm, I'm publishing. And because they follow the, the principles of user sovereignty, um, they're pseudonymous by default, which means I can have any number of these and they don't necessarily have to be tied to my personal identity unless I want to. So I'm the one who gets to choose, not Google. Um, one of the other things you can do with these things that we discovered is you can do off-chain NFTs because these are provable provenance records. If you're recording hashes and CIDs of, of other data, you can actually track, whoops, sorry, you can actually track um, the history of the file. So if there's versions, modifications, whatever, you can update the CID, the hash, and you can say these are the old versions, these are the new versions. We added in the ability to fork them and to have a, a link from the parent to the child and the child to the parent. We can also merge them as well. What this allows you to do is if I own a photograph, I record its hash, its CID, and I, and I say I'm going to make 10 legitimate copies of it. So I fork 10 children, provenance logs, and then using a, a key, secure two-party key rotation intellectual property licensing regime protocol thing that we have, I can um, give securely give ownership over these child provenance logs to whoever pays me for a legit copy of my photo. This is not DRM. This is just provable provenance. So whoever buys them from me, this is like a private art sale, private NFT. It's not on chain, nothing. You don't need cryptocurrency. Um, I can sell to them the record and because of its cryptographic nature, it's non-reputable that I sold it to them because it's recorded in mine and theirs has a record to mine. So um, this allows me to create legitimate copies of any kind of data. One of the things we're doing right now is tracking all the inputs um, into AI training, all the, all the training data. So we have an end-to-end -end intellectual property regime. So you can prove that you either own the data or you properly licensed it when you trained your LLM. 
and that the starting model was a permissively licensed one like Llama or whatever, it's not proprietary. So therefore anything that you prompt it with is yours and anything it creates is yours. And you can make a legitimate legal argument that the whole thing is not infringing on anybody's intellectual property. We use them for PKI, right? So the, we're, what I'm gonna show you here just in a second, and I'm running out of time really fast, is uh, basically a decentralized key base. Um, how many of you guys know Keybase? You ever use Keybase? Yeah, so how cool would it be if you could just have a tool that runs locally, generates your keys, creates a provenance log, pushes it out to IPLD, or IPFS, um, sets up a DHT record that maps uh, to your provenance log, and then you can find your friends from there, the, the keys that point to their provenance log, and you had like a signing tool, and you could do this in Git and all this kind of stuff. That's what we're building. That's, that's actually what I'm gonna show you today. We have a whole bunch of other stuff we're building with this, but this is the most, this is kind of where we're starting, right? The neat thing here, and this was like an O oh moment, was when we realized that when we were working with these verifiable key histories, we effectively eliminated the need for key signing parties. Because if I compromise, if one of my keys was compromised or I lost it or I rotated or whatever, because of the cryptographic verifiable nature of the provenance log, anybody who had a reference to my, to my provenance log could always get my latest key. They never had to come to me and we had to check each other's ID and whatever. Like, you know, I didn't have to fly to Berlin to get access to some software repo again. Um, you can just do it like this because if you, if you trust the cryptography, then you can see that their old key is in their key history and you can verify all the way up to the latest one and know that that's their, their current key. Do you see where I'm going with this? Hey, your public key is no longer valid. How do I restore it without having to talk to you? It's just like those URLs, right? Like I might have a long URL, it goes to a page that doesn't exist. It goes to a page at the server that says, hey, let us help you find what you're looking for. This does the same thing, but for public keys. Um, we use them for AIM, or IAM. We've figured out how to, how to translate pretty much any kind of policy from an enterprise IAM system into these. The coolest part is that they're stored and enforced at the edge because they're fully decentralized. There is no central server here. That means you can put them in Git repos. And this is cool. I'm censoring myself because I have children and they're gonna be like, I wanna watch you do your talk and I don't wanna to have to put money in the swear jar. <laughs> um, the, uh, the web of trust, okay? So I think we can get there. I think we're building it. Um, what I was gonna say here is that if you put provenance logs in repos, okay, you can build a repo now that has the verifiable key history of every contributor in your repo ever. And if you make the, the highest priority proof for the lock scripts be a, a majority, simple majority threshold signature of the maintainers, they effectively become the admins of your account that's in the repo. So if you lose your keys, they can sign a new key rotation and recover your account. If you're a jerk, they can also force rotate your key to null and kick you out. So they are admins, you're, and, and you can enforce this because the regime we've designed is when you join one of these repos, the first thing you do is you submit a patch that has your, your uh, provenance log with one event, which advertises your public key, which uses the lock script that delegates the root um, uh, proof authority to the threshold signature public key of the maintainers, also contains a public signature, or a, uh, sorry, a, a digital signature over the code of conduct and of the contributor licensing agreement and all those things. So they have to sign the legal agreement and that's all visible in this provenance log. And it gets added to the repo and that's you joining it. Because the regime around the repo is that no code, no other commits are added to the repo unless it's digitally signed by the latest public key in one, of the re in one of the provenance logs that's already in the repo. Does that make sense? So you have to give them the provenance log, which means you have to digitally sign things, you have to delegate to the maintainers. This allows us to, I wish I could go back quickly, but remember I said Git didn't solve these problems and that's what made GitHub inevitable. This solves those three problems. So this is GitHub without the hub. 
Okay, can we build the web of trust? Well, we need a new identifier. We call them very long live addresses or Vlad. You're welcome. I thought this was cool. I was like, this is, I, I can't not call it this. This is gonna be amazing. Okay. Um, they are not derived from key, from key materials, so they're not uh, subject to compromise. Um, they are the concatenation of a digital signature over a CID. The CID points to a WASM script, a WAC lock script, that validates the first entry in the provenance log. Okay, and the provenance log contains the public key. It's ephemeral. You, it, you create it just for signing the CID to create the Vlad, and then you destroy the key pair immediately. Okay, and this gives you a closed loop cryptographically bound identifier to the first entry of the provenance log that also references the validator script that validates the first entry of the provenance log, and you have an identifier now that is not key material, is not compromisable, it doesn't mean, make any sense because it's just a random number, a CID and a digital signature or whatever, and the key pair to recreate the digital signature is gone, and um, therefore it can be stable over the life of the provenance log, and so this becomes like the domain part of a URL. It's stable. Okay? They are three tier or three state links, just like URLs. They're valid, they're invalid, or they're partially valid. If you have one, and because a, a Vlad doesn't isn't all there is. It's a Vlad and a public key, typically, because you're encrypting something to a public key, so you're saying, hey, I'm gonna send this to them, and you give the Vlad and the public key. Well, the public key part might be invalid. But the Vlad part never changes, and you can use it to get the, pub, the provenance log so you can update the pub key part. Um, this is the identifiers we use. They're just a concatenated, you know, multi-hash encoded Vlad and a pub key. Um, that's the very stable part. Uh, we need a new DHT. We joke around calling this IPNS version 3. Um, it maps Vlad's uh, to the, the most recent, oh, so it does two things. It maps, or it actually does three things. Maps pub keys in the wild to the CID of the event in the provenance log where that pub key was first advertised. So if you find my pub key in the wild, you can go and ask this, and it's like, oh yeah, that was Dave's key in this event. That might not be the most recent key I had. It might be somewhere in my history, but every event in the provenance log has the Vlad. So then you can take the Vlad and you can always get the most recent event in the provenance log. So you can go public key to somewhere in my history, to Vlad, to the head of my history, and you can get my whole history. This allows you to go from an old public key to my latest public key. It allows you to convince yourself that I was the author of those old commits or that old um, photo or whatever. One thing that I, just blows my mind that I don't think I've ever heard anybody say is, but in a world where we're digitally signing everything, you're going to have old data signed with old keys. And if you don't have something like this, how do you know that those old keys are the same person or the same controller or the same smart contract or whatever that has these new keys? How do you link them if you don't have something like this? So we're going to have old data signed with old keys, and you got to have some kind of history to link them. Um, and then the other, the last thing they do is that when you submit an update to your provenance log, they actually run the validation scripts, the WASM scripts. And um, if it checks out, then they update the Vlad uh, to point to it. They add it, and, and it's what enforces the, um, the force recovery. So if someone steals my keys, they'll publish one. That's fine. I can have my friends do a threshold signature, and I can overwrite it because these peers will see that mine has a higher precedence than theirs. And so it replaces it and updates the Vlad, and I force rotate back to my control. Um, this, we have a new signing tool. We call it Better Sign. Um, this is going to get me in trouble with my kids. Um, I called it that because I just really want people to be saying BS signatures. I think that's a funny thing in my head for some reason. Like, this signature is totally BS. Um, it makes me laugh. I, so it, it, it replaces GPG. It works with key histories, not key, ring, key rings. It talks natively to the DHT via libp2p. Um, we're, we're building better signed peers at this moment that are like pinning services in, in the sense that you'll publish a public key, or uh, sorry, provenance log, and it will make sure it's available in libp2p. It does all of these other functions of mapping and everything like that. So um, how do we pay for all of this? Because this takes a lot of energy. We're going to launch something that is like decentralized key base. It'll be a freemium thing. So you'll get 
to be able to publish provenance logs. You'll be able to look up people's provenance logs, validate them, all that stuff. There'll be a limited use that's free. So enough of, you know, there's enough there that if you're a developer, you can have one of these and it'll work just like Keybase did, except it's fully decentralized. Um, and of course, you want if you want to like track the provenance of all, you know, all of your 80,000 photos, you might have to pay a little bit more money for more provenance logs, more updates, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I'm going to switch real quick. I know I'm probably out of time. In fact, I was probably out of time 10 minutes ago. Um, this It's written in Rust. I'm just going to show you here. This is just a quick run. So I just this is just the help screen for opening a plog. It, you can see that it takes like a lock script, an unlock script, um, and then some Vlad parameters, you know, and then it outputs and everything. So let's do that. Let's do one. Okay, so here we go. Actually, let me clear my screen here. I'm just going to give it some test uh, lock script, unlock script, and then I'm, um, the, the Vlad parameters, they only really need the first lock script, but you can all of these here, you can define like what hash function you want it to use, what CID version you want it to use, and all that kind of stuff, how you want them encoded. The, the same defaults, and thank you to Robin, are the same defaults, I agree, are Blake 3. And uh, actually, I chose base 32Z because I just like the way they look better. But if we run this, um, <laughs> you can see here, this is the Vlad that it calculated. It's, it's this long string. I know these are going to be big, but they need to be for enough entropy. And it's, it's still fairly tiny because it's, it's an ED25519 signature. Um, you can see that it was verified by this public key. This was the ephemeral public key. It's actually stored under Vlad key inside the first event of the provenance log. But the private key has been destroyed, securely destroyed at this point. So nobody can, cre you know, like can create a new signature with this. Um, inside, it has one entry, and inside the entry, you can see it's got, it, I advertised a, um, a signing key. So this actually was the ephemeral key used to sign it. The reason the entry key and the Vlad key are separate is because what I didn't show you here is the right way to do this is with uh, Lamport signatures because they're quantum resistant. That makes the Vlads much bigger, so I didn't want to do that here because it would just be a full screen of text. But there is a way to make these things so that they're quantum resistant. Um, here's my first advertised public key. So you could get this out of the province log. Uh, here's the CID that's in the Vlad. Here's the, the whole Vlad data. And here's the key, the public key. This is all in the first entry. So given the Vlad, you can use this to verify that the Vlad is, is valid. The digital signature over the CID is valid. You can pull the CID out and go get the WASM lock script and you run it against this. You run the unlock script in the first entry and then you run the, the, the lock script that the Vlad points to and this all checks out. That's what this is showing you actually right here. That's what it did. Okay, so I had to demo because, you know, we like running code, don't we? Um, here's where I turn on my shill hat. I know, uh, I just wanted to point out that to, as of today, we've released all the specs. Uh, the specification for multi-key, the specification for multi-sig, the specification for the provenance log, the specification for the WAC VM, um, so like what functions to expose in a WebAssembly thing. So that's all there. These specifications are completely open. They're community specifications. So feel free to implement the specifications in whatever language you want. The other one here is, this goes to the homepage of one of my companies and that's launching the pinning service, the, the freemium you know, identity stuff. Uh, we have implementations of all the specs in Rust. Everything except better sign and the better sign peer is permissively licensed open source. I'm doing an experiment. I have been a hardcore open source person for 30 years. And the last few years I've been working heavily and exploring all the spaces of how we, how we fund the maintenance of open source software. So I'm going out on a limb here. The better sign code and the better sign peer code are going to be source available, but licensed under the business source license with a two year span and then a reversion to Apache 2. So, for the, so if you want to use our code in a non-commercial educational way, feel free to do so. 
But if you want to incorporate it into a paid service or a commercial product or anything like that, come to me. We'll figure out a reasonable licensing thing. 20% of the revenue of the licensing money is going straight into a community chest that will pay for um, grants for anybody who wants to build anything using these specs. Um, and then the rest of it is going to be used to maintain the infrastructure and to fix bugs and to make sure that there's improvements in this as we go forward. So, um, yeah. If you sign up, so go to here and there's a request access button on it. If you give it, it's just your email. I promise you I'm not going to sell anything. But I, I need to test interest is what I'm trying to do here. And so if you sign up before August 1st, we'll make sure you get the developer thing, which gives you a lot more provenance logs and a lot more updates and all that stuff. And we'll just give it to you for free for the first year.